Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the mysterious unknown? I am Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. You have found the Dark Oak. Stephanie, have I got a crazy story for you today? The crazier, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will be very happy then. Okay. We're in the betterest, the bestest. <laughs> That's right. Now, this is one you've probably heard about because, it's, because it is highly covered, but it's just one that, man, every t- I cannot get enough of it because it's just so bizarre and I just have no clue what happened. So today I'm going to tell you the story of Rebecca Zahau. Yes, let's do it. Oh man, it's crazy. Okay, so Rebecca Zahau was a 32-year-old woman living with her millionaire boyfriend named Jonah Shacknai. And Jonah made his millions as the founder of Medicis Pharmaceutical Corporation. Rebecca and Jonah had been dating for two years, and they lived together in a home that Jonah owned that was known as the Spreckles Mansion. Have you ever seen pictures of the Spreckles Mansion? No, but I want a house that has a name. (laughs) Can that be like a life goal? Yes, please. (laughs) I've always thought that. And I thought, oh, maybe it's like, like, I don't know, like, I haven't found the name yet, but yeah, something like Manor or yeah. Yeah. Any anything yeah. that warrants a name. I'm like, I need that in I'm my with life. You with my little 1400 square foot house. <laughs> All right. Well, tell me about the Speckles Mansion. Okay. So the Spreckles Mansion is a giant 27 room beach front property in Coronado, California. Coronado is a resort city that was located in San Diego Bay. So before dating Rebecca, Jonah had been married twice before with his most recent marriage to a woman named Dina Shacknai. And from that marriage, uh, he had a six-year-old son named Maxfield, who everyone called Max. And he also had two older children from his first marriage. So on July 11th, 2011, six-year-old Max was home alone with Rebecca and Rebecca's then 13-year-old sister, Zena. Now, Zena lived in Missouri with hers and Rebecca's parents, but she was in town visiting Rebecca. Okay. So while Rebecca was in the downstairs bathroom and Zena was in another bathroom taking a shower, Rebecca heard a loud noise. And she thought it sounded like a crash or maybe a dog barking. But when Rebecca went to see what she had heard, what she found was six-year-old Max laying on the floor in the foyer by the stairs. Okay. Now also on the floor were some scattered soccer balls and then laying on top of Max's leg was his scooter. Oh, this doesn't sound good. Yeah. The chandelier that hung from the ceiling in the middle of the stairwell was also laying on the floor. Yikes. Okay. This does not sound good. It's not good. It's not good. Um, as Rebecca was processing the scene, what she was able to gather was that Max had somehow fallen off of the mansion's second story, which is really not good. When Rebecca found Max, he did not seem to be breathing and he seemed unresponsive and she immediately called 911. When rescuers arrived, they were able to get Max breathing again, but not before he'd been without oxygen for almost 30 minutes. Oh, bless it. I know. And this this lack of oxygen obviously did cause irreversible brain damage. He was taken to the hospital where he would stay for several days, but unfortunately he did pass away five days later. So when Max was taken to the hospital, Jonah and Max's mom, Dina, pretty much stayed there by his bedside for the five days that he was there. Max's death was ultimately ruled accidental. But Max's mother, Dina, felt that there was more to the situation. And she would later say, quote, things just didn't add up to me, end quote. So Dina was really suspicious that there was more to her son's death, so much so that she asked for Max's death to be reinvestigated in 2012. It just didn't make sense to her that, you know, what happened. 
And I'm sorry, what was the date of the accident? The date of the accident was July 11th, 2011. Okay, so a year later. A year later, okay, yeah. Got it. She even hired her own forensic pathologist, Dr. Judy Melanick, who also disagreed with the accident finding. And she said that she believed Max was actually assaulted by another person in the upstairs hallway near the banister on the second floor. And then somehow was either thrown or fell Whoa. over the balcony. Okay, that's that's a little hair raising. Yes. Now, despite Dina's concerns and the findings of, you know, this path forensic pathologist, the Coronado police still refused to reopen this case. And again, it has remained considered a tragic accident. Now, the day after Max's fall, Rebecca took her little sister Zena back to the airport so she could fly home. But while she was there, Rebecca picked up Jonah's brother, Adam Shacknai. Adam was a tugboat captain who lived in Memphis, Tennessee, and he came to town to be there for his brother during this difficult time. Yeah. Okay. So the night that Adam came to town, Rebecca, Jonah, and Adam all went out to dinner with a mutual friend named Howard. And after dinner, Rebecca and Adam returned to the Spreckles Mansion property while Jonah went back to the hospital to stay with Max. Yeah. Makes sense. Max's mother, Dina, was also at the hospital on this night. And we need to know that. We need to remember Jonah and Dina were at the hospital okay. that night. So Adam and Rebecca get back to the mansion property, but instead of staying in the 27 room main house, Adam stayed in the property's guest house. So, okay. Yeah. At first I was like, well, that's weird. It's a 27 room house. But then I thought, well, if I could choose to have a guest house all to myself, especially if my brother weren't going to be there, like as the buffer, I'd probably pick that too. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like if he's a tugboat captain, I don't know that they have that good of a relationship. It may have almost been like, it just made sense for him to stay at the guest. I don't think that that alone is, I mean, I don't think it's weird. No, at first I did, but the more I think about it, no, I don't think so. Either. I mean, also 27 bedrooms. Right. <laughs> just like also. Wow. Right. Also just wow. Like I'm just like, wow. Also 27 bedrooms 20 in a guest house. Just because, you know, 27 bedrooms wasn't enough. So let's create a whole nother building. Right. The property. Because, well, and I think that's the point that like makes me like, why didn't he stay in the main, ho main house? Because it's not like they'd have to be running into each other a lot. You know what I mean? Like there was plenty of space. But again, you know, people are weird. People are weird. People, people are, are weird. Yeah. All right. And maybe he just wanted to give them space because this tragic, like, it, even though, I don't know, you think you maybe want to support her, like be there for like emotional support. But if they didn't have that close relationship, then maybe this guy is just not an emotional dude. So maybe he almost felt uncomfortable being around like the grief and the accident and those kinds of things too. Right. And I don't know too much about their relationship. I do know that Rebecca is the person he spoke to about coming to town to visit. Like he couldn't actually get through to Jonah after the accident. Yeah, so he. Sense. He talked to Rebecca and was like, hey, should I come? And her response was, I think you should do what, what you feel is right kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. And then she's obviously the one who picked him up. So they had some kind of relationship. I don't know how close. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Okay. So after getting back to the mansion, Rebecca had three different phone calls and several text messages with another one of her sisters, Mary. And Mary would later say that during these conversations, Rebecca sounded like her normal self. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Other than, of course, the obvious, you know, trauma they were going through. Yeah. But but that was it. That was the only thing that seemed off. There were no other indications that anything was wrong. Mary said Rebecca sounded tired. But other than that, she sounded like Rebecca. She said, quote, I wouldn't call her distraught. She was upset, very concerned, very worried over Max's condition, just like any caregiver or parent would be, end quote. At 10.41 p.m., Rebecca received a text message from Max's aunt, Nina. Nina is the twin sister of Max's mom, Dina. So Nina and Dina, twin sisters. Creative. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> so this text message from Nina asked if she could come by the mansion to talk about what happened to Max. Rebecca never responded. Now, Thinking about this, thinking about I was the adult who was home with Max when this happened, and now his aunt is texting me saying, hey, can I come by and talk about what happened? <sighs> That's no matter what, that would just not be a pleasant conversation. That would just be a hard conversation, I feel. I feel as 
yeah, I mean, you're you're there. You witness this tra- like this horrible tragedy. And even though, I mean, Rebecca wasn't his mom. I mean, it's still. I mean, the trauma that's happening. Of course. So I don't know that I would just want to talk to anyone. I probably only want to talk to my very close circle. Right. Right. And then to have you know the sister of the little boy's actual biological mom saying, can I come over and talk to you about what happened? That, you know, that just, I don't know. I just thought, ooh, that that wouldn't have been a pleasant text message to get. Yeah. And so I kind of understand why maybe she wasn't in a place to like respond right away. Maybe it was just yeah, like, Yeah, I totally me. agree. Especially yeah. at 1041 at night. True. You know. Because I would think at that time, like, maybe... Maybe somebody's had a few pops and right. they're sending you a text message. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, eh, it's probably not, it's it's probably not the state that you would want to talk to someone. Not in. great timing. Yes. Not great timing. That's yes. the vibe I get as well. At 1230 a.m., Rebecca received a phone call and Rebecca did not answer this call, but a voicemail was left. Now, authorities have not disclosed who this call was from officially. But Rebecca's family has come out and said that this call was from Jonah. Okay. And here's the thing, and it's one of the great hangups of this case. No one other than Rebecca has ever heard that voicemail. Because records show that Rebecca did listen to the voicemail for two minutes at 1250 a.m., just 20 minutes after it was left. But the voicemail was deleted and was unable to be recovered. So we do not know what was said in that voicemail that is allegedly from Jonah. Okay. Rebecca will be dead approximately two hours later. Whoa. So the next morning, July 13th, at about 6.45 a.m., Adam said that he walked outside of the guest house and he saw Rebecca's nude body hanging by the neck from a main house balcony. Her wrists and ankles were tied with the same type of rope and her hands were tied behind her back. She had black paint smeared on her breasts. The palms of her hands and fingers were clean and her feet were covered in dirt. The rope that she was bound with and hanging from was described as water ski rope and it was the color red. Rebecca was gagged with a blue long sleeve t-shirt that was wrapped around her head with the sleeves double knotted and stuffed into her mouth. There was also what appeared to be tape residue on her legs. This is terrifying. Terrifying. This is absolutely terrifying. Yes. Ugh. And also bizarre. So bizarre, right? So terrifying bizarre. and bizarre and horrible. And it's going to get so much absolutely more bizarre. Horrible. It's okay. It's going right. to get so much more bizarre. Oh boy. Yeah. So Adam called 911 at 6.48 a.m. Now, let's talk about this call. So on this call, he said something to the effect of, quote, I've got a girl hung herself, end quote. I've got that's, a girl that's one of the things she, he who said. hung herself. Yeah. Okay. And some people think that's strange wording. I don't know. Because he didn't say, hey, my friend Rebecca hung herself. He didn't say, hey, this body's hanging. Because I don't know if I walked out and saw a nude body hanging that was bound and gagged. I don't know that my first thought would be, oh, she hung herself. I don't think I would have many thoughts outside of I just need to call the police and there's somebody hanging. I don't know. Right. Like, I don't know if my brain could be able to wrap around. And you wonder, too. OK, here's another thing. If he we don't know how far the guest house was. Right. So what if he just saw her but wasn't up close enough to see all these little like details i don't know i mean clearly you would have known she was nude but i don't know maybe she liked to sleep in the nude i don't know right well and um i do think in these moments we've talked about it before in these moments you don't really know like what's going through your head and what you're gonna say so i don't put a whole lot of weight into a bizarre 911 call i just think the whole thing is just so bizarre though it's so bizarre so weird it's so bizarre but you know a lot of people are like that's just weird. I've got a girl hung herself. Didn't use her name. Didn't say, hey, this girl's ha-. like, uh, there's been an accident or I don't know. That's true. He could have been a little bit more eloquent. That's true. Right. Yeah. But again, 
we don't really know. Yeah. We don't, you know, it's easy to say. How do you know what you're going to say when you're right. looking at this macabre scene? Right. I don't, at least yeah. you got words out because I don't know that I would. Yeah. So you're, that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. you're just like, I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. There's, you just need to come. Yeah. Yeah. So come, come yeah. help. Yeah. Now. So he tries telling the 911 operator where he is, but he doesn't know the actual physical address of the mansion, which makes sense. He doesn't live there. That's totally fair. Yes. He tells them it's on Ocean Boulevard and he keeps telling them it's the same place where you picked the little boy up yesterday. Okay. That's fair too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Only it wasn't yesterday that the little boy was picked up. It was a couple days earlier. Um, and, you know, this wasn't necessarily a person on the call. Like, th it, that's helpful if that's all you have. But it wasn't enough for them to, like, pinpoint. Yeah. yeah. I see why he kept saying that. Because to them, you know, when you have a personal tragedy like that, it, to you, it, it's like this mountain that has happened. Right. But, of course, to everybody else, like, they're trying to look at it in the scheme of all these other injuries and, you know, horrible accidents that they're trying to look through the lens of. Yeah. Right. And and the operator keeps saying, I wasn't working yesterday. I didn't take that call. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't know. Yeah. But again, he's doing everything he possibly can. He ends up finding the address. And I think how he finds the address is he literally like runs to the street. Yeah, that's to, fair. To find like yeah. the, the address. So it takes him three and a half minutes to get this, the actual physical address to the operator. To run across the sprawling property. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean. Um, and you hear him on the phone running and puffing and, and then, you know, he says, oh, I'm going to perform CPR. Like, you know, and what we find out later is the whole time he's on the phone, he's actually been like doing stuff, you know, um, Adam told officers when they arrived that he'd actually, while he was on the phone, moved a three-legged wooded table over to where she was hanging so that he could climb on top of it and reach her in order to cut her down and that he attempted CPR on her. So all this had happened before oh the police even gosh. came. Like, wait, cut her down from a balcony? Yeah, like he brought a table over. I'm assuming like an outside oh, table. Oh, I see. Like, so from the bottom story, he like reached up. Okay. Yeah, all like right. he pulled a table up over to where she was hanging, climbed on top of it so he could reach like to a cut nightmare. her down. Like a straight nightmare. Yeah, and then attempt to perform yeah. CPR on her. Oh, gosh. At some point during all this... Adam sent a text message to Jonah telling him Rebecca was dead. And again, that I don't know what you would do in that scenario, because like, obviously he wants to let his brother know it's his brother's living girlfriend. I don't know if he tried calling first. I don't know. I, I don't know. He's already got like what a what a position to be. What in. a position to be in. Yeah. Yeah. But that's literally how Jonah learned that okay. something had happened with Rebecca. This poor guy, as he's in the hospital. Uh, with his son. Oh, gosh. In the room where Rebecca was hanging from, there was a message written in black paint, and it was the same paint that was on her breasts, saying, quote, she saved him, can you save her? End quote. This was painted on the wall in the bedroom that she was hanging from the balcony of. The rope that Rebecca was hanging from was tied to the footboard of the bed. And there was also a steak knife found in the second floor guest bedroom. So it was a second floor guest bedroom. It was not her bedroom. It was not the master bedroom. And there was blood on the handle of this knife. Now, there was no blood anywhere on Rebecca's hands and she had no scrapes or cuts. And then a second knife, a chef's knife, was also found in this bedroom. And this one had Rebecca's fingerprints on the blade. Officials looked at this, along with the rest of the scene, and decided that Rebecca had committed suicide. Oh, um, ah, yeah. uh, okay. It's not how I would commit suicide. I can just tell you that. Uh, it's a little bizarre. It's a little bizarre. I mean, she's nude. She is gagged. She is bound at the well, ankle. Well, and that weird message. What the on earth message. does that message mean? I what? mean, that's like, what? Well, if you just take the message alone. Okay. She saved him. Can you save her? But the thing is, and they don't know it yet, but she did. If this is about Max, she didn't save Max. She attempted to save max but max 
you know, Max ended up passing. So, like, is this, like, oh, yeah. some weird, like, twisted, like, she saved him, can you save her? But at the time, they didn't know Max was going to pass. Unless, and I think I have this alluded to later in my script, but unless that voicemail that she allegedly got from Jonah the night before that was immediately deleted and nobody else has ever been able to listen to, unless that voicemail was Jonah literally saying, hey, we've we've heard that it's like max is not going to come out of this kind of thing in which case would that be motive for a suicide, for a suicide? potentially of course i'm sure there was very deep grief and if she felt at all responsible because she was the only adult there like you know i don't know well has anybody asked Jonah? <laughs> I mean, I know that's... A, so when you say the family has come forward and said it was Jonah, that was Jonah that came forward and said, I left a voicemail? No, that was Rebecca's family who has said that oh, was Rebecca's Jonah. family. Rebecca's family. Oh, so we don't actually... And, but the th and police have never... It gets real complicated and I will okay, come I'm up to Okay, I'm not going to gonna it. jump ahead, man, because I have so many questions. There are so many questions. And you'll still, okay. even after I tell you everything I know, you'll still have so many questions. Okay, go. Okay, but let's first just, like, let's just start off with the idea that this was, in fact, suicide. Okay, nude, gagged, bound at the ankles. Gagged? Yeah. Wrist tied behind her back. How do you even do, is that possible to do? Well, they have recreated this and found that it is possible. Mm. that a person do because they literally recreated it in a trial okay um it's like a contortionist but yeah this it it's possible but it's very weird not to not to mention just like bizarre okay first of all if you who's going to kill themselves nude i mean that is like a a level of like degrading or like humiliation that is it would nobody ever do it? I'm, I can't say that. But like. If she genuinely felt responsible for this little boy's death, Joe, though, I don't know. Okay. So you. Okay. Because for me, that and uh, that right there. She, she was also a very conservative Christian woman. Mm. So on top of just like the normal being nude and being exposed like that. Like, you know, for her, that was like, a you know, she didn't just go around walking around nude. You she was know. just very conservative. Conser yeah. yeah, she was yeah. conservative. Yeah. So being revealing or being provocative was not her deal. It would have been very much out yeah. of her nature. Um, in general, women, when they do commit suicide, they do it in nonviolent ways. Generally, you know, maybe an overdose of pills, some type, even when we murder people, we do it in nonviolent ways. <laughs> I love how she said we. <laughs> My last six murders were all nonviolent. You wonder how we know so many things. <laughs> but, but you know, women are like generally, there's always exceptions, but generally women, you know, will poison someone as opposed to like, you know, sure, shoot, shooting sure, them or. Sure, sure. Yeah. Another thing is women generally don't like to do things to themselves that are going to make them look ugly for like lack of a better word like they don't that's part of the reason why we don't care for like the violent you know okay. self-inflicted deaths okay. because like i guess somehow in most women's minds like we think about somebody's gonna find me and i don't want to necessarily be found hanging nude you know yeah. like kind of thing so statistically it's just a weird way for a woman to kill herself as for her arms and legs being bound, that is very rare, but there are instances where a su suicidal person will tie themselves up before attempting suicide so that they are unable to change their mind and save themselves later. So it's very, very rare, but it is not unheard of. Police do find in their investigation that it would have been possible for Rebecca to get herself into these bindings. They actually reenacted it with a woman about her size and height. It is possible Difficult, not easy, but possible. Now, here's something that for me is like, I don't know, again, kind of takes the whole, if, if that wasn't enough, like to me, this just makes it seem weird. So that, that blood that was on the knife handle. Yeah. They believe that to have been um, menstrual blood. Oh. Right. So that means for the blood to have gotten on the handle. They believe she was penetrated with this knife handle. So. She have done that to herself? Exactly. Like, that's bizarre. They're, so they're saying that she, like, 
penetrated herself with a knife handle and then hung herself on her period, nude, free bleeding. With a weird message on her wall. That's just weird. Is it impossible? No, I guess not. I mean, anything's possible. People do weird things all the time. Yeah. But that is just really weird. It's 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 too many things. It's, if it was right. one of those things, that's one thing. But all these things combined would not make me think suicide. No, exactly. I think that's that's the big thing. Like, okay, could it have been a suicide? Yes, I guess potentially it could have been. But to jump straight to suicide is a little weird. Like, and she didn't have any like hist history of depression. Like she wasn't meeting with uh, like a psychiatrist or doctor. Not that not, we know of. Not okay. that we know of. Okay. Not that we know of. Yeah. It seems like a big leap. It does. It does. So the medical examiner did arrive on scene, but not until 12 hours after Rebecca had been discovered. Oh, uh, okay. And guess where Rebecca was during that 12 hours? She was left laying in the grass in the elements, nude for many of those hours. Now, eventually, investigators came and like covered her up because at this point, helicopters were flying overhead taking photographs. And you can actually find photographs of her laying there nude taken by helicopters flying, you know. Ew. Right. So eventually they did like cover her up. And I understand it's why so you wouldn't. It's so distasteful. Dis it's so disgusting. And I understand why they wouldn't necessarily want to cover her up until everything's been fully processed. They don't want to contaminate. But at the same time, well, then maybe let's start processing this scene as yeah. opposed to, you know, oh, you know, let me finish. I don't know why the delay to get somebody there for so long. But at the same time, if a body lays somewhere for 12 hours in the sun, in the heat, like, yeah, it's. We're already compromising the scene here. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Not to mention how insensitive it is to lay, leave oh, a, a nude woman laying horrible. in a yard for 12 hours. I horrible. mean, like, that's just, you know. I mean, every every bit of it. I mean, right. so the, the police, the detectives, the, the news reporters, like, all of it. Just very, it, just icky. It, yeah, just ugh. So Rebecca did have an autopsy performed, obviously. And the results revealed four instances of head trauma. And this head trauma has actually caused all kinds of theories. Now, San Diego medical examiner Jonathan Lucas stated that because there was evidence that she went over the balcony in a non-vertical position, she may have struck her head on the balcony on the way down. Forensic consultant Dr. Maurice Godwin expressed doubt, stating, the chances of bumping into the railing while going over the balcony and hitting your head four separate times is highly unlikely. Yeah, unless she like catapulted herself off the balcony. Right. Which again, doesn't fit. And again, this is a second story balcony. It's not like you're going off a skyscraper where you're going to hit a bunch of things on the way down. Like, right. Now, could she have like come and then like swung you know what i mean yeah I mean, but that's yeah. what i'm saying i mean but even that you have to go off with a good deal of force to create head trauma right. four separate different times. times right so you know but there's two varying one doctor says yes possible and one doctor says no as for the note written in paint on the door which again doesn't even make sense like what does that even mean what does like that mean? it doesn't i don't know um who wrote that? Was it her? Was she being ironic? Was it somebody, if if this was not suicide and somebody did this to her, is it anger? Like, you were here with him and you didn't save him. Now, can, you know, she saved him. Can yeah, you but save if it was it anger, if it was anger, and this is like, I'm like, maybe it was suicide. Because if it was anger, that doesn't make any sense either. Because then why would you be praising her for saving him? Right. Yeah, the, that's the thing. The note doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't sense. make sense in suicide and it doesn't make sense in homicide. And it doesn't make sense with the scenario. She saved him. Can you save her? Like, so weird. It doesn't make sense in in any scenario. About Ugh, this whole thing. It's so weird. I know. It's just bizarre. Unless it has maybe nothing to do with Max at all. Like, did Rebecca save Jonah? Now, can you save Rebecca? I, I mean, I don't, again, it's so cryptic. It's just, yeah. it's bizarre. So Sheriff Gore looked at this message and said, okay, it's not a clear suicide note, but it's close enough. 
you know, it's close enough that investigators did use this painted message to, you know, further their belief that Rebecca committed suicide. I mean, again, it does fit more with suicide than homicide, but it doesn't exactly fit with suicide either. I can't say that it's a clear cut suicide note, which it's I guess is what they're cut, saying here. But it does fit a little. I don't know. It's still a leap. It is like an artistic way of being. I mean, yes, I can totally see it as being something somebody says right before they kill themselves in a weird, I mean, I, in a oh. weird, not clear way, but right before you gag yourself, I, 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 it just you doesn't, know, that doesn't I know, sense. Weird. Okay. Okay. Now, Rebecca did like to paint and uh, it was one of her hobbies and she'd always signed her paintings in the past. Rebecca's siblings looked at this message and did not believe that it matched her handwriting. Handwriting experts did come in and they also said it did not match her handwriting. However, it is very difficult to differentiate between writing on paper and say on a flat table surface, flat table surface, and then writing on a vertical surface with paint. Oh, yeah. Like, I wouldn't even see how you could even translate it. Really, they say that you can't. Like yeah. experts say that it really can't be done. Now, here's another weird thing about this note. If Rebecca had written this message, because of where the message was on the wall, she would have had to have held her arm up high above her head. It was written higher on the door than would have ever have been natural for Rebecca to write it. So uh, that's weird to me. Because if I'm going to paint something on a door, my suicide note or whatever, like, you would think you'd paint it in a place that would at least be natural but to like paint it like so and there high was above your head that she was like standing on no. something no it was just it was well above what would have been a natural is it possible that she painted it yes absolutely but her arm would have had to have been fully extended okay that's reaching weird. up higher way higher than would have and it's one of those things that you wouldn't even think about like you wouldn't think you know what I mean? Where am I going to place this on the door to throw them off? At least I wouldn't. You would just naturally write it in a place that's somewhat natural to take to paint, I would think. But again, if it is a suicide, like, yeah, I mean, you're not trying to hide anything. Right. Rebecca's DNA was found on the knots of the rope and on one of the knives used to cut the rope. So, like, obviously, whoever tied her up had to cut the rope. And they're assuming those are at least one of the knives in the room was used for that. Black paint was found on her hands and the rope, as we discussed. Her fingerprints were found on the paint tube and one of the two knives. Her foot and heel prints were found in the dust on the balcony. A lot of it is lining up that yeah. she, you know, she prepared things. She touched the paint. She walked out onto the balcony. She wasn't scuffling with someone on the balcony. She was walking on the balcony. Right. But there were no other DNA or fingerprints found in the room. Despite these little inconsistencies, this case has officially been ruled a suicide. But for those of us who are not convinced, one of the main persons of interest, at least for, you know, armchair detectives, is <laughs> Adam Shacknai. So let's well, talk about Adam. Well, yeah. Yeah. So as far as we know, he was the only other person on the property with Rebecca that night. So that alone makes him someone we want to look into. But on top of that, he was a tugboat captain, and he knew how to tie all different types of knots. And the knots that were used to tie Rebecca up were obscure nautical type knots, not something the average person would know how to tie. Ooh, intriguing. Very. Because I know how to tie a basic knot. That's all I know. If I had to, I would have to like literally Google how to do anything else kind of thing or YouTube it or whatever. So um, just interesting, just a little, little interesting bit. Hmm. Now, Adam's internet search history was reviewed and it was found that on the night that Rebecca died, and this could potentially be a little trigger possibly for some people, Adam had used a computer to search for pornography using terms like raped, Sexy Asian Girls Bondage Anime. All right. Rebecca yeah. was Asian. So again, like, is it related? Is it not? I don't know. But man, what a weird, uh, like. Yikes. Yeah. That just like is very weird, right? Especially These... with that whole like knife penetration thing. Right. Well, well, and just raped 
bondage and oh, okay well that sexually... that alone but i'm just saying in regards to this case right i mean yes that guys that's not okay oh, <laughs> <laughs> let's just stay for... sorry i should have right. i should not have glossed over that well, like no yes. but like but like <laughs> yeah but how she saying, was in, found. The con- in the context of this i'm like yeah. okay like all of a sudden things about the case start like pop like highlighted things like oh okay this this and this could line up with that theory right she was found bound so there are certain things that line up with the suicide theory correct certain things that line up with homicide specifically connected with adam and so i'm just thinking of those things right right yeah absolutely so rape sexy asian girls bondage anime and these searches found images of asian women bound and there were also similar pornography searches found on adam's iphone so both the computer and iphone were used to look at these types of pornography sites the night she was the night she died investigators said that there was no other identifiable dna found at the scene other than what belonged to rebecca of the samples actually tested so that's confusing but here's what that means They obviously didn't test every single thing in the room. It is possible that there was other DNA in this room. That would have fit more with the homicide theory than the suicide theory. But of the samples that they actually took, so like the paint tube or the knife blade or whatever, the rope, of those things, the pieces that they tested, only Rebecca's was found. But again, they didn't test every single surface in the entire room. So it doesn't, the point of this is that it doesn't point to anyone else, but it doesn't mean that there couldn't have been somebody else's DNA in the room. No, that's fair. It just, yeah. of what was tested, there was no other. Even though you would think if Adam was the killer, there would be some of his DNA on something that they tested. You would think, unless you wore gloves. Or Mm -hmm. were proper. Right. So, yeah. So Rebecca's family really did not agree with this whole suicide finding. And they ended up having her body exhumed for re-examination in 2011. And when they did so, they hired Dr. Cecil Wecht, a forensic pathologist who worked on cases including JFK and John JonBenet Ramsey. And Dr. Wecht performed another examination of the body and concluded that her death was the result of homicide. Bum, bum, bum. Mm-hmm. So because of these findings, Rebecca's family filed a wrongful death civil lawsuit against Adam Shacknai. And during the trial, Dr. Wett said that the cause of death was trauma at the base of Rebecca's neck, which he said is consistent with manual strangulation. So he believes that Rebecca was actually strangled, then hung to look like she committed suicide. And... And this was not evident at the original autopsy or it just wasn't noted? The original autopsy revealed the head trauma, which the medical examiner said was consistent with her going over the balcony. Right. And hitting. But then one of the consultants who worked on the case, you know, disagreed with that. Man, another twist. Another twist. This wrongful death civil lawsuit they had a jury, they had judges, they had everything. And the jury heard from a neighbor who in a videotaped deposition testified that she had heard Rebecca scream for help the night she died. This neighbor is Marsha Allison and Marsha lived one door down from the Spreckles mansion and said that at 1140 PM, she heard a 20 or 30 something year old woman scream and say, help me, help me. She didn't do anything. <laughs> also, I'm Apparently like, Apparently not. And, I'm assuming, again, sprawling mansions. Can you hear? Like, it's hard for me to imagine, too. Now, there were other, there, there's, you could, we could spend a whole season talking about this one case. Because, I, I mean, I have really condensed this just because there's so much. And a lot of it can't be confirmed. Like, there's Fair. other um, documentation saying that some people believe there was a house party with loud dance music going on on this same night. Oh, which, of course, Adam Shacknai completely. Yeah, it's not confirmed, yeah. confirmed. And it is very, very bizarre to imagine that they're having a dance party when he's in town for his nephews, you know. Yeah, that doesn't seem to fit. Right. And it's just Rebecca and it's just, and there's no, you know, so that's why I wasn't even going to like mention it. But so all yeah. I have to say, like. There's all these different, like, witnesses coming in saying, like, little things here and there. Yeah, but we're not sure. We're not sure. 
So after more than six weeks of trial, the jury in this wrongful death civil lawsuit actually ruled in favor of Rebecca's family, awar awarding nearly $5.2 million in damages. Adam Shacknai has appealed this verdict. However, before San Diego Superior Court Judge Catherine Bacall could rule on the appeal, Rebecca's family agreed to a settlement with Adam. The judge dismissed the case, but said on the record that there was sufficient evidence to find Adam Shacknai responsible for Rebecca's death. So, according to the police, according to, you know, the criminal, I guess, investigation, it was a suicide. But according to this wrongful death civil lawsuit, there was, I guess, no official ruling because it was settled. But the judge is saying, I think this guy's responsible. Yeah. And I think this may be where the phrase, you know, um, without reasonable doubt, you know, so maybe there's enough to have doubt because, again, the weird message, like, I can't think of, I mean, unless you want it to look like a suicide, Right. You know, but then again, why make such a weird, enigmatic message? Right. You know, I would just say, like, I can't deal with it. I'm sorry. Right. You know, like, why make such a weird message? Like, that just doesn't make any sense. But it doesn't make like, because I feel like, man, if you're going to let's say it was suicide, she wouldn't have necessarily known that someone was going to find her and question it. Like, I don't think if she did kill herself, she was trying to set Adam or anyone else no, up. No, it doesn't sound like it. Right. Or she would have made it more clear. Right. So why be kind of, you know, I don't know. Like, I understand, okay, if you're afraid you're going to change your mind, I can understand binding yourself. I don't understand the hanging yourself nude. I don't understand the penetrating yourself with a knife handle. I don't understand the weird message that makes no sense unless it makes sense somehow too. And also gagging yourself. Is that something that you would do? I guess maybe you might gag yourself. If, I mean, like, she you must have had some to... real, some, I guess what I'm saying is she must have had some real self hatred. Yes. To have committed suicide in this way. In this way. Now, I can kind of see, okay, if you're afraid that you're going to scream, I'm sorry, this is like icky to think about. But like, if you're afraid that you're going to somehow make noise mm -hmm. or something and alert attention and they'll find you and help you and you don't want that, hence you're, you know, yeah, you're bound. bound and stuff. Okay, maybe that might be why you would gag yourself so that you couldn't make noise. But again, very weird, very, very rare. Seems like a stretch. Yes. So the judge in the civil trial said that the sheriff's investigation leaves as many questions unanswered as it did answer and that it is fair to ask who, in fact, killed Rebecca Zahau. They said there are still credible people out there questioning the suicide findings. So I mentioned earlier that they had, you know, tried to recreate this scene that she was found in you know, in different ways, like recreate it, make sure it was possible for a woman to get in this position, all of that. When they did this, they actually recreated, they had a, a doll or a dummy. This doll was recreated to be her size, her weight, everything. And they even like, and a lot of people were like really bothered by this, but they literally made it look like her and like painted her nails. And like, it, it went beyond, a lot of people were like, ew, that was... That was a little gross because Not necessary, right? They could have just used a very like obscure, like, "Hey, this is her exact weight and measurements." Ew. But instead, they Who literally are all these it. insensitive people I don't know. out there. I, know. I mean, leaving her body out forever, recreating it with a doll that looks like her, right? Because it's unnecessary. Unnecessary. Like, yeah. Um, but when they did this, what they learned is if Rebecca had actually jumped out of the window. Then the bed, because remember, she was, it was tied to like a, the leg of the bed, the yeah. rope, would have moved in every single experiment that they did this. The bed moved like 21 to 24 inches when it like naturally was the way a person would actually throw yeah. themselves well, over if the they weight, had, like the yeah, weight of the, the bed, weight of the weight on right. the rope pulled the bed. Right. But in Rebecca's case, the bed only moved a couple inches. Which, again, leads people to say, was it possible that she was already dead, maybe through strangulation or through something else, and instead of thrown over or um, jumping over, literally, like, placed or, like, gently lowered down? 
because the bed didn't move and it should have with the weight of her body being thrown out of a window or falling out of a window, jumping out of a window, the weight of her body should have moved the bed. And it only moved a couple of inches as opposed to the 21 to 24 inches that it moved in every single one of the reenactment reenactments using her well body. and also if there was any way she could have eased herself down in suicide that then wouldn't explain the head trauma right you can't have both right well and and you know I, saying if she was like swinging or you know whatever it right, is right. like that doesn't yeah. work so again, the crime scene, I mean, I don't know that she was murdered. I really, truly don't. Because a lot of it does kind of line up to suicide. But there's just inconsistencies with everything. Like, if if she killed herself, why didn't the bed move? Yeah. If she was murdered, well, why is nobody else's DNA in the room? Now, again, I have only brought to you stuff that like could really be corroborated but i did watch like a true crime you know show on this and they interviewed some of rebecca's friends and family and one of the things that in one of these interviews uh, had come up i think it was rebecca's brother-in-law said that in addition in this room things that were not necessarily listed like on the evidence list were like some dryer sheets found in the room hmm. and he said it didn't make sense for these dryer sheets to be found in the room because there was no laundry. There was no folded laundry. There was no nothing like that. But dryer sheets, one of the things that can be used is cleaning. Like they tell you like for your baseboards yeah. to clean your baseboards with dryer sheets because there's some kind of oil in them. Yeah, it like repels the that dust. repels yeah. the dust. And so he's saying, well, if there's no fingerprints, if there's no this, if there's no that, is it possible those dryer sheets were used in cleanup? Huh. Another thing, there's tape residue on her like thighs as if to like bind her legs. Uh huh. The tape was never found anywhere in the house. Oh. So there's residue on her legs as if that was maybe the first attempt. Like originally she was being her. bound with tape. Yeah. So the residue is on her legs. There's no tape anywhere. Not in the bedroom, not in the trash, not anywhere in the house was this tape. So if she first attempted to bind herself with tape and it didn't work she abandoned that and tried something else where's the tape hmm for me the tape yeah the that's... only yeah the only explanation for that is someone else took was the tape there. with them but why would they take the tape well i don't know because tape would potentially hold like if i were trying to hurt somebody and again it wouldn't look like a stage even though i don't know i mean but then why leave that weird mess i i yeah. don't know it's so just weird. another thing that doesn't make sense it's just another thing but i can see why like if i tried to bind somebody with tape and it didn't work i might take the tape with me um because i'd be afraid maybe my fingerprints on her or I, my hair stuck to it or you know i don't know but you wouldn't take the knife you wouldn't, well, and that, you know, but I, mean, I would, <laughs> you wouldn't take the paint tube. I, I, you know right, what I'm saying? Right. Like, I mean, yeah, it's just another weird thing with no real explanation. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to leave you with this. A private investigator has teamed up with a psychic reader to analyze the actual bed used in Rebecca's a house death. So in 2008, a private eye named Bill Garcia who had been hired to investigate the death of Rebecca by insurance companies representing Dina Shackney. So Dina hasn't let this go. Now, Dina did at one point say, I don't necessarily believe that Rebecca caused my son's death, but somebody did. Okay. Which, fair. Okay. Okay. Bill Garcia gained possession of the bed that was used in Rebecca's death. And Bill Garcia said, it's what I call the deathbed. The bed that Rebecca was tied to with the red rope. That sounds sinister. I know, right? Now, Garcia got this bed through a random meeting with a construction worker at a taco shop in Mission Hills. What? This construction worker had done remodeling work at the Spreckles Mansion. And the bed was given to his construction company. Now, I guess they just start talking. And Garcia learns he has this bed. And he says, I intimately worked on this case for four and a half years. So when he said one of his workers had possession of the bed, to me, it was really exciting because I felt that there was something very important about that bed. I took pictures of the bed before I collected it. I used gloves. I wrapped it in saran wrap completely and I put it in my vehicle and took it to my home. 
Garcia then hired a psychic, Jackie Benzinger, to come read the bed. And the psychic said, quote, I opened up the bottom portion of this particular leg on the right side of the bed where the red rope was, and I put my hands on it, and almost immediately I connected with Rebecca. She connected with me and told me immediately, yes, I was murdered. Then just a second later, Max Shacknai appeared, and he said, I want to be with Rebecca. I love her. Now, Bill Garcia has worked with this particular psychic on missing persons cases many times over the years, and he fully trusts her skills. He says, I think Jackie is for real. I know she has trained and been taught by some of the best on the East Coast. Skeptics are going to be skeptics no matter what. There's not much you can do to change their minds. During her reading of the bed, Jackie Bessinger said she saw how Rebecca Zahal was murdered. She said Rebecca was on the bed. She was lying down. Her eyes seemed kind of fuzzy because sometimes I feel like I'm on the inside of the person and I looked up and there was a man standing above her and then he strangled her and she passed. The psychic also believes Max Shackney was murdered. She tried to connect with the boy a second time. She said when I connected with him, he was gone. All I picked up from him was just light. So he's moved on. Bessinger said that she could not identify the alleged killers. She believes there may have been two men in the room at the time of Zahal's death. Garcia is worried that the case may never be solved. He said, I feel that these deaths will be overlooked essentially because of wealth, power, and some people in law enforcement that don't want to see the truth come out. The San Diego County Sheriff's Department has ruled Zahal's death a suicide. But again, in 2018, a silver jury found Adam Shackney, Jonah's brother, liable for her death. So Zahal's family continues with a lawsuit in San Diego County Superior Court aiming at forcing the Sheriff's Department to turn over more evidence and investigative files in this case. And that's where the case stands now. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I've said it all I even have to say. I have no idea. It's so weird. At fr the first time I heard it, I was like, there's no way she killed herself. No way. And then I hear it again and I'm, or read it again. And I think, okay, maybe she did. I mean, I feel like if you just make the list of everything we know, several of the things fit very neatly into the suicide category. Several things fit very neatly into the homicide category. Mm -hmm. And many things fit directly into the middle. Right. And so I don't know. It's very... Very weird. I'm trying to think of motive. The, the only motive I can think of is maybe just like anger over Max's death. But again, he had not even passed by the time this happened. And why would you say she saved him then? Right. If you're angry that he passed, wouldn't your message be something like you ended his life? Now I'm ending yours or something. Right. Now, um, Again, like... Unless you want to stage it to look like a suicide, which, again, would be the argument, right? But why? It Yeah, it doesn't It doesn't make sense. The, the big theory that the police have is that when this alleged voicemail that came in that only Rebecca has listened to, the theory is that during that voicemail, Jonah said, Max is not going to make it. And upon hearing that news... Rebecca decided she just couldn't couldn't do it anymore and killed herself. Yeah. I don't know. Part of me actually wants to kind of lean that direction just because it, she would have been going of her own choice. Still incredibly sad sure. and incredibly sad to think because, again, no, nobody has really said that she was the cause of it, of the accident. Right. right? Um, so but how incredibly sad as well if she. Because, again, because of the self-hate and, and mm -hmm. loathing that must have gone into it if she did all these things on herself. Right. Um, how very grim her last, you know, few hours right. would have been. Very, very sad. It was a very sad case. Very sad. And, you know, if that is what happened, I mean, I just feel terrible for her because it was just an accident. Yeah. And she uh, was in the bathroom. Like. Yeah. You know, it, it just like. Yeah. And to. Put yeah. that on her. I hate that. I hate that the thought that anybody else would put something on her. Like yeah. they're angry. Like just a bad situation. So yeah, wow. that's the case of Rebecca Zahal. I don't. I don't. And know. it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like the sheriff's office, the police detectives, really want to look at it any further. Right. And, and I do. So, you know, it, it's not like it's not like there are sleuths still kind of going after this because without any more information, where else is there to go? Right. 
And at this point, I mean, it's been 12 years. I don't know that, you know, you know, they, I don't know. It this, would, this may, I mean, I hate to say it because I think we can solve anything, but this right. may remain unsolved. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing that like gets to me, it's always weird to me. Like when there's like official, there's an official like ruling the police department saying this is a suicide. That's what it's been declared by like, you know, and then, but then a judge hold, or, or a court holding a person responsible for her death. Like that's two very different things. It, it is. But I, again, I think like that's, yeah. Even if the police had changed it to like, undetermined yeah. or whatever it is like that would have been that would sit better with me mm -hmm. um because it's saying yeah we think yes we think she was murdered mm -hmm. but no we don't have enough evidence to convict anyone right that's different than saying it was a suicide but the problem with keeping it undetermined means that it's still i guess maybe possibly kind of open or can be like if they rule it a suicide, at least in other cases that I've read, the, once it's ruled a suicide, like no more investigation can be done. It's been ruled upon. Like this is what it is. Oh, so you're saying there's like an I like kind of what it like closes it. It yeah. like gets it like off their list. Like they want them to close. Like they want it to. Yeah, be closed. it's you know. Yeah, I mean that just I'm off not, their docket. Yeah, I'm not saying that that's what happened. I'm just saying like that's that's because I there have been other cases that you know they can't. The family is trying to like get more information or have more testing done or what or whatever have more people looked into and they're like it's a suicide it's closed or it was an accident it's closed we're not going to do any more investigation because this case is closed whereas if you leave it kind of like open-ended well it's not closed we can do more testing we I can know, do I guess that's something that that's why i wish they had left yeah it. sure yeah of course because then they're at least acknowledging that there are things in the case that don't make sense and let's be real there are things in the case that don't make sense this would be i mean you have to be yeah. blind to say absolutely it all lines up right but doesn't right which to me thinks they're not looking at all the elements of the case right. so yeah i mean sorry guys it's just going to remain open because that's not the clear obvious answer right i i'm with you completely yes i completely... you know what i'm saying like that to me I, i'm sorry you didn't solve it and i'm not saying you even have to at this point because let's be real there's it, it's almost an unsolvable case with what right. we have but to say definitively it was a suicide I think is you can't say that for sure. Right. No, now, no, you can't. now, if you're saying, yeah, we're pretty sure she was killed, but we don't have enough evidence to convict anyone or say for sure it was a homicide. That's a whole different ball of wax to me. And that's much more palatable. Yes. Um, but to say for sure it was a suicide, I, I think is, I mean, that's pretty brazen. Yeah. And yeah, no, I'm with you. I completely agree. So oh, so happen. frustrating. Yes. Yeah, so frustrating. So yeah. Well, I I like the idea that Rebecca and Max are together. Me too, because all reports, um, even even from like Max's family, you know, um, say that they really did genuinely like each other, yeah. and that she was really good with him, and he really liked her, and they were buddies. And so, you know, I do I do love the idea that they are together. I like that. All right, yeah. I'm just gonna dwell on that. Yeah. Because sad sad case very very okay well that's a doozy join us next week for more thrills and chills thanks for joining us on the dark oak bye bye, bye. This has been a Just Us Gals production with artwork by Justice Holmes and music by Ryan Creek.